Hey guys, it's Sarah here. In this video, I'm going to be going over the med surge part two of the NCLEX RN. So before I get started, I just want to let you know that, that this whole video is available in a PDF form at my website, www.sarahwithanhrn.com. And there's a part one of this. You click, you click up below to watch and you get the full NCLEX RN video also on my channel. So let's get started. Okay, so first we're going to be talking about the gallbladder. So, the main thing you should know about the gallbladder is cholecystitis. And what that is, is that it's itis. So, itis means inflammation. So, it's an inflammation of the gallbladder. And causes of this are gallstones. Um, the gallbladder is, is located in the right upper quadrant so the person's going to come up in with right upper quadrant pain so that's specific to like gallbladder usually it could be referred to the right shoulder or scapula but just look for the keyword the right upper quadrant pain and usually they ate fatty foods right before like an hour to three hours before this happened because the gallbladder is the one that processes the bile to break down the fat some other symptoms they could have is reg regular nonspecific, like chills, nausea, vomiting, fever, etc. And what you want to know is that there's something specific to gallbladder called the Murphy sign. And what that is that the patient lays flat on their back and they breathe in. And you palpate under their ribs, kind of like this one is doing right over here in the picture. And then if, if the patient stops breathing when you're palpating, then it's a positive Murphy sign and it can indicate cholecystitis. So treatment for that is going to be, first of all, nothing by mouth. Second of all, um, like anti-nausea medications, pain medication, hydrate. And usually it's called by, caused by the gallstones, like I said. So then you would do an ERCP to remove it. Or you could do cholecystectomy. So that's the next part. So what that is, is it's basically a surgical. Ectomy means surgical remover. So it's a surgical remover, removal to procedure to remove the the gallbladder after um they have it you want clear liquid a clear liquid diet until the bowel sounds return and then you kind of gradually go up so a little fat diet um as a, and then they keep eating regularly okay so now we go on to the kidneys and adrenal gland uh, Okay, so there's acute kidney injury and chronic kidney injury. So over here, I've made a chart so you can see that, um, you know, like what's the difference between the two. So acute is obviously going to be sudden. Chronic is going to be like a lifelong or long um, illness. So acute kidney injury is irreversible. Chronic kidney injury is not. Causes of acute kidney injury. So either it could be pre-renal, intrarenal, or post-renal. So pre-renal are stuff that happens before the kidney. So, um... Injuries to that could be dehydration, they're not getting enough fluid in, so the kidneys are not functioning like they should be, bleeding, um, intrarenal is, is injuries to the kidney itself, so nephrotox nephrotoxic medication, glomerular nephritis, and post-renal is stuff after the kidney, like the bladder, so injury that prevent the urine from draining out, like a stone, enlarged prostate, something after the kidney. Um, Causes of chronic kidney disease is hypertension, diabetes, acute kidney injury, if not treated, could lead to that, infection, etc. There are different stages. So the stages for acute kidney injury is initiation, oligaric, diuresis, and recovery. So initiation is when the ki kidney injury occurs, um, and then oligaric, olig oligaric has decreased urine output, so the symptoms are going to be starting. And the next stage is the, the diuresis, when the kidneys are slowly healing and the urine output increases, and you have recovery, which could take months or years. In terms of the chronic kidney in disease, you have the stages, it goes according to the GFR. So GFR is normal, but the kidney is damaged, it goes all the way to, to GFR is below 15. So treatment for acute kidney injury, you're going to reverse the cause. So like if you look over here, if let's just say it was nephrotoxic medication, you're going to stop that. And reverse the cause. Um, the chronic kidney injury, like we said, is not reversible. So you're just going to kind of slow the progression or stop the progression as opposed to curing it. And treatment for that 
is dialysis, kidney transplant, control the hypertension, depending on which state they're at. Um, um, okay, so next under kidney and adrenal gland, we have the AV fistula. So an AV fistula is, as you see in this picture over here, it's a connection of the artery and the vein. It's used for vascular access, like every time they do the dialysis. So you should know about this, it takes several weeks to mature. You want to help pay for a thrill or buoy, and you want to have a limb alert. So you shouldn't be sticking them for blood on that site. You shouldn't be putting IVs on that site. And you should have a bracelet that's a limb alert to let everyone know that. Um, what is dialysis itself? It's basically removing the toxins and the water because the kidney does exact. It's basically doing the function of the kidney. So the kidney is supposed to remove the toxins, um, you know, water, everything else, and it's doing it for the kidney. Before doing dialysis, you want to hold the medication, and the reason for this is because you're just going to give it to them just to be taken out of the body. Um, and you want to watch out for hypotension because, like always, whenever there's a lot of output out of the body, you want to watch out for hypertension. Um, there's two different types of dialysis. You have your hemodialysis and you have your peritoneal dialysis. So your hemodialysis is um, outside the body. It's when blood is passed through a fake kidney which is basically the dialysis machine. Um, and it, it is done for like three days a week usually, usually every other day, every other week. And it's, and it's done through access to the blood via the AV fistula, like we just talked about in the slide below before that. Um, I want to tell them that one more thing about the fistula is that when you're trying to mature the fistula, they should squeeze a rubber bowl to get it mature um, and big. Um, peritoneal dialysis is when the, the solution, so the dialysate, is infused in the abdomen cavity. So one's going to be like in the arm and one's going to be in the abdomen cav cavity. And, and if it's in the abdomen, it's going to be a catheter. And it's basically clamped. And then you allow the fluid to dissolve a certain amount of time and you unclamp it and then the fluid drains out via the gravity. Um, when it is clamped and it's just sitting there, you want to monitor the patient for respiratory distress. Um, complications of it could be peritonitis, so that's um, from the contamination of the infusion. Some other stuff you want to know about dialysis is you want to watch out for something called DDS, which is dialysis disequilibrium syndrome. And this is very rare, so you don't really see it much, but it is life-threatening, so you should know that. It is basically um, happens when it is infused too fast, so the prevention of this is slow the infusion. Um, okay, now we go on to nephrolithiasis, which is a kidney stone. Symptoms of the main like symptom that people talk about is a right flank pain. Um, they're also going to have usually abdominal pain, but usually it's like right flank or left flank, depending on which kidney has the pain. Um, they could also have nausea, vomit, etc. Causes can be from like a lifestyle, immobile, um, they're not moving much, they're not drinking much, stuff like that. So treatment for that is going to be ESWL, which as we see over here, it's basically shock waves that break up the kidney stone, um, or nephrolith lithotripsy, which is um, to remove the kidney stone also. If it's not severe and they're very small, it could you pass itself through um, a urine straining cup that you could send the patient home with and tell them to drink a lot, ambulate, and to strain all the urine in it. Okay, so pyelonephritis. When someone has a UTI, a urinary tract infection, and it's not treated, there's a bacteria in the urinary tract, it could travel up. And when it travels up, if you think about the anatomy, the ureter travels up to the kidney. So that could cause pyelonephritis, which is basically a severe bacterial infection in the kidney that causes it to swell. They're going to have regular nonspecific symptoms like chills, fever, vomiting. But the main one is that you're going to see is the flank. Anytime we talk about the flank, pain is usually where the kidneys are because they are on either side. Um, and one also very specific symptom to pyelonephritis is CVA tenderness, costovertebral angle tenderness. 
And the way you test for that is as you see over here, you're gonna place your fist on right by the flank, by the kidneys, you're gonna like thump on them. And if they, if they like move away and if they have like pain, then it's a sign that they could be having pyelonephritis. So for this, you wanna give them fluids, IV antibiotics and blood cultures. Okay, so a renal biopsy, biopsy in general is basically taking a small piece of tissue to examine it um, under a microscope. So renal biopsy is exactly that, taking a small piece just of the kidney, examine it under a microscope. But the main thing you want to know about this, the contraindications to doing that is uncontrolled hypertension and post-op you want to monitor for bleeding. Um, pheochromocytoma is a tumor that is on the adrenal medulla. What it does is it causes excess release of the catecholamines like epinephrine, norepinephrine, and it can lead to hypertensive crisis. So if you want to treat that, you want to treat that with nitropyricide, which is basically to lower the, lower the blood pressure. With the pheochromocytoma, one of the main things you want to know is never palpate the abdomen. Okay, so next we go on to Cushing syndrome. What I like to think about Cushing syndrome, just think about steroids. So Cushing syndrome is too much steroids. So you're gonna have symptoms exactly of that, like at androgen excess, which means, means like acne, you're gonna have menstrual irregularities, a lot of hair. Um, you can have metabolic symptoms, which is truncal obesity, hyperglycemia, the moon face, the buffalo hump, and you're gonna have skin changes, which is going to be like bruise, bruising, purple, striae, etc. Um, treatment is going to be depending on the cause. If the cause was from too much steroid medication, you obviously want to stop and decrease that. The next one is Addison's disease. Addison's disease is the opposite of Cushing syndrome. It's from too little corticosteroid, and the symptoms are going to be the total opposite. So you're going to have hyperpigmentation, hypoglycemia, remember steroids causes um, sugar to go up, so this is going to cause it to go down. You're going to have weight loss instead of weight gain, like Cushing syndrome. Um, um, okay, now we go on to the thyroid. So with a thyroid, you have too little and too much. So hypothyroidism is very common and has symptoms that are going to be uh, fatigue, gaining weight. It's like it's basically all the symptoms of a slower metabolism. So like fatigue, gaining weight, etc. When it's really severe, it could, it could get into myxedema coma, which is could be life-threatening. Um, for hypothyroidism, you want to give them Synthroid. That's like the main medication you're going to give them. Levothyroxide, Synthroid. And it's usually on it for life. Um, hyperthyroidism is not that common. Um, symptoms could be an enlarged thyroid gland. And what you want to know for this is treatment is going to be radioactive iodine or thyroidectomy, which, which means that you remove it. Um, when it gets severe, you want to watch out for thyroid toxicosis, which is basically a thyroid storm. Um, so just think of someone with hyperthyroidism is the opposite of hypothyroidism. So like we just said before, hypothyroidism is like um, gaining weight. Just think of someone just sluggish, fatigue. So hyperthyroidism is going to be someone who's very thin, loses weight very easily, someone always on the run, energetic. So when you have some, when you have it to that extreme, like thyroid toxicosis, you're going to have symptoms of the extreme. So you're going to have fever, tachycardia, cardiac arrhythmias, anxious, restlessness, etc. Treatment for that is iodine and beta blockers to lower the blood pressure, reduce the fever, hydration, etc. Um, one more thing about hyperthyroidism is that Graves' disease is an autoimmune disorder that could cause hyperthyroidism. It's basically that the immune system is attacking the thyroid and causes it to make more thyroid hormones than necessary. And those people are usually going to have symptoms of exothalamus, which is like 
um, bulging eyeballs and yeah. um, okay so here's a question so the client is diagnosed with hypothyroidism which sign and symptoms so that nurse expect the client to exhibit so number one extreme fatigue and hair loss number two exothalamus which like we said before was the bulging of the eyes and complains of nervousness number three complains of profuse sweating of flush skin or tetany and complains of stiff hands so i'll give you a minute to answer that um okay so the answer is number one because a decrease in in, in a thyroid hormone like i said it just decreases the metabolism so it causes fatigue hair loss weight gain etc Okay, so now we go into the bladder and the urinary and pelvic system. So pelvic fracture, fracture, what you should know about that is that's usually caused by falls, especially in the elderly, or MVEs, like motor vehicle accidents. What you want to know for this is you want to assess for internal hemorrhage, neurovascular deficits, and abdominal injuries. Pelvic inflammatory disease, which is PID, is when the bacteria from the genital tract spreads upwards through the cervix and causes an infection in the female reproductive system organs. It's not contagious. Um, it's caused by untreated STDs, STIs. So risk factors are going to be that, like multiple sex partners, previous STDs, STIs, unprotected, unprotected sex, all of that. Complications from that can mean that it could lead to ectopic pregnancy and infertility. So you want to treat it and treat it with antibiotics because like I said, it's bacteria. Um, then we go on to preoprism, which is a prolonged erection, which for like medical terms is usually more than two hours. Um, It's going to be blue, it's going to be intense pain, and it's usually caused by medication like Viagra or pre-existing conditions like sickle cell, cocaine use, etc. Um, paraphimosis is when you cannot pull back the foreskin to original position. Um, and for that, the treatment is manual reduction and medications. Next thing you should know about is testicular torsion. So this is actually an emergency, which is why you really should know it. It's when um, the spermatic cord twists and it cuts up the blood supply to the testicles. And the reason why this is a medical, is, is it's an emergency is because it's very time sensitive. So it has to be surgery within like four to six hours or else um, their, their testicles are gonna be like necrotic. It's, and then that, is infertility. So you want to catch that right away and treat it. Question. A 16-year-old boy enters the emergency department reporting acute scrotal pain. He's diagnosed with testicular torsion. What treatment would the nurse expect? Cool compress, immediate surgery, ultrasound-guided external manipulation, and rest and, and elevation. So like we said before, it's an emergency surgery. Um, okay, so next we're going to urine specimen. What you want to know for this is never do it from a collecting bag because bacteria grows there and you want to clean with alcohol before voiding. Um, timed urine collection test. You just should know for this is that you don't count the patient's first void. It goes after the first void. Okay, so urge incontinence and overactive bladder is when they have a strong urge to go. Um, causes this is either spinal cord injury, impaired bladder, neuro diseases like strokes, etc. Um, there's a lot of interventions to be done depending on the cause. Number one, they could lose weight because um, you want to reduce the pressure on the pelvic floor. Anticholinergic medications like oxybutynin could be used. You want to avoid stuff that, that irritates the bladder, like caffeine, um, nicotine, etc. And you could do pelvic floor exercises. Urinary retention is commonly seen as a post op complication. It's also seen in BPH. Um, if it's acute, 
urinary retention, you treat it with rapid, complete bladder decompression. Um, stress incontinence is basically when you have incontinence only caused by physical activity. So for instance, like coughing, they'll cough and then they'll leak a little bit. Or when they run and they'll leak a little bit. For this, you want to prevent skin breakdown because if they're sitting on the urine, it's going to, um, it's like acid and it's going to wear away. Um, you want to bladder train them also. Okay, so a vasectomy is a permanent male sterilization technique. It's an alternative to, to birth control. Um, that's pretty much it. Hussery is a, a vaginal device that supports the bladder. It's fitted and you should know they can remove it themselves. Okay, so a urinary tract infection, you just know that this could be any part of the urinary tract. So the urinary tract consists of the bladder, the ureters, the kidneys, any of this could be considered a urinary tract infection. You want to educate them on ways to prevent it. So they should wipe from front to back, not from back to front. Um, they shouldn't be constipated or straining. Drink a lot of fluids to keep stuff moving out. Don't hold themselves in. Don't use antibacterial soap. Um, no bubble baths. Wear cotton underwear so it's um, not like so tight fitted and it has room to breathe. Um, you should know in the elderly patients, urinary tract infection can cause symptoms of mental st mental status change or confusion. N next, we go on to benign prostate hypoplasia, which is BPH, which is basically the prostate is enlarged. Um, the problem for this is that when the prostate is enlarged, the urine can't come out that much. So treatment for this is medications like finasteride and symptom management, they may need to go for prostate surgery. The prostate surgery is called a TERP, which is transurethral resection of the prostate. Um, okay, next we go on to prostatitis. Itis is always inflammation and prostate is prostate. So inflammation of the prostate is caused from bacterial infection and as always we treat bacterial infection with antibiotics. Symptoms, they could have urinary hesitancy, urinary urgency, burning, etc. Um, okay, next we go on to the musculoskeletal system. So what is CAS? So CAS is basically, as you see in this picture, it's used to immobilize fractures, extremities during healing. You don't want them to get the cast wet, you want them to elevate it above the level of the heart for the first at least 48 hours to reduce swelling. You want to um, do exercises to prevent the muscle from wearing away because it's in the cast all the time. We want to watch out for, for something in a cast is compartment syndrome. The compartment syndrome, you watch out for the signs of like pain that is not relieved by medication, pallor, tinginess, numbness in the hands, something that is indicating that's too tight and it could lead to compartment syndrome. You should also tell them not to put anything in the cast, like no toothpicks, no anything just in the ca cast. If they have um, foul smelling or, or redness or persistent itching, you want to think of infection. Um, for a sling, you want to tell them to keep their elbow at 90 degrees. You want to tell them to have their hands above level of the elbow and the bottom of the sling ends in the middle of the palm with fingers visible. So quadriplegic is when the lower limbs are completely paralyzed and upper and the upper. So it's quad is four. So the upper and the lower. It's almost always caused by cervical cord injury and depending on the injury of like depending on the injury the airway could be affected also. Um, myasthenia gravis is an autoimmune disorder in which um, acetylcholine receptors are blocked and what it causes is fluctuating muscle skeletal weakness. The first muscles that are affected are usually the facial muscles and the ones that are like ch chewing and swallowing. So the symptoms you're going to be seeing is upper lid, eyelid, like droops down, 
double vision, stuff like with their vision, that's going to single that. Treatment is going to be medication for that. And complication is a myasthenia gravis, myasthenia crisis, is when the muscles that are affected are the respiratory muscles, which can cause respiratory failure. GBS is Guan Barre syndrome. And how you distinguish this is that it's ascending muscle weak paralysis. So it's going to start from bottom, it's going to go ascending, it's going to go up. Always with the muscles, you want to watch out for respiratory failure. So question, which assessment data were the nurse assessing a client with, with Guan Barre syndrome? An exaggerated startle reflex and memory changes, cold uh, rigidity and not able to initiate voluntary movement, sudden severe unilateral facial pain and not able to chew, progressive ascending paralysis of the lower extremities. So like we said before, the key one for this is ascending paralysis. Okay, so now we go on to ankylosing spondylitis. What this is, is that it is an inflammation of the spine that over time could cause the small bones in the spine to fuse. There's no really no cause and no cure. Um, it's just symptomatic, pretty much like proper posture, daily stretching, no smoking, um, NSAIDs, etc. External fixation is when you put metal pins or screws through the skin of the bone and attach them to metal rods outside the body. And this is done just to immobilize a part of the body after a fracture. Um, what you want to know for this is you want to check the pin site for signs of infection, neurovascular assessments, and notify the doctor if the pins are loose. But don't turn them. That's what we can't do that as nurses. Okay, so here's a bunch of like osteo. So osteomalacia is softening of the bones from vitamin D deficiency. And you wanna replace the vitamin D because it's deficient. Osteomalitis, itis is um, bone infection and it's an infection, so antibiotics. Osteogenesis imperfecta is brittle bones that fracture very easily. And what you wanna do for that is you wanna prevent fractures. Osteopenia is bone loss, you want to have calcium rich foods. Osteoporosis is less porous, so porosis is less porous bone. Um, stretching, etc. Osteoarthritis is progressive loss of cartilage and that's from wear and tear. With all the osteos and all the bone and muscle stuff, you want to watch them and put them on full precaution. Um, here is a comparison between osteoarthritis and rheumatoid arthritis. Osteoarthritis is from breakdown of cartilage. Rheumatoid arthritis is autoimmune. A main symptom of osteoarthritis is asymmetrical morning stiffness that lasts less than 30 minutes. Rheumatoid arthritis main symptoms is symmetrical morning stiffness lasting more than 30 minutes. Um, osteoarthritis usually happens later in life. Rheumatoid arthritis is autoimmune. It can happen whenever. The joints that are affected in osteoarthritis is the main, um, the weight-bearing ones, the knees, the hips, and the rheumatoid arthritis because it's autoimmune is the small ones. Pain usually improves when you move it with osteoarthritis and it gets worse when you move it with rheumatoid arthritis. Um, Treatment is going to be PT and NSAIDs for osteoarthritis and rheumatoid arthritis NSAIDs and DMARDs. So Parkinson's disease is a neurodegenerative disorder that causes tremors, basically. It basically causes like a loss of autonomic movement, rigidity, shuffling gait, and resting tremors. It's caused by an imbalance of dopamine. There is no cure, unfortunately, but there are medications like anticholinergic to help stop the progression. ALS is a progressive disease that kills the brain cells that control the muscle movement. So it only can kills the brain cells of the muscle movement. Symptoms could range. It could go from spasm to atrophy to difficulty swallowing. Because you have to remember that that is a muscle also. 
Um, there is no cure, unfortunately, and the life expectancy is usually two to five years from the time that they have the symptoms. Symptoms, like I said, is muscle weakness, um, constipation, fatigue, difficulty swallowing, respiratory failure, paralysis. Interventions, respiratory support um, with BiPAP or mechanical ventilation if needed, mobile assistive devices like canes, etc. Um, communication assistive devices if they can talk, medications, only slow the progression by three to five months, unfortunately. Um, MS, multiple sclerosis. So MS is a progressive demyelinization of the central nervous system that stops nerve impulses. So your symptoms are going to be muscle weakness, spasticity, loss of balance, fatigue. Um, it could You could have like exacerbations, which usually caused by temperature extremes, dehydration. Um, you want to give them assistive devices for help, exercise, you know, bladder training it really depends on how bad their symptoms are. Corda equina syndrome is when you have injury to L4 to L5 and it causes motory and sensory def deficits. It's a medical emergency and the main symptom they're going to have is they're not going to be able to walk all of a sudden, severe lower back pain, saddle anesthesia, and bladder bowel and bladder incontinence. Um, a treatment is you want to right away reduce pressure on the spinal nerves to prevent permanent damage. Um, okay, next we go into rhabdomyolysis. What this is, is that its skeletal muscles are injured and they break down. And when they do that, they release a protein into the bloodstream called myoglobin. The problem is that this protein that it releases is toxic for the kidney, so it could lead to acute kidney injury. Um, it could also cause a shift of electrolytes, which causes dehydration. It could be caused from really anything that damages muscle, like overexertion of muscle, crush injury, heat stroke, trauma, etc. Symptoms you're going to see very dark, like cola brown, amber color urine, fatigue, elevated creatinine kinase, and you want to give them a lot of fluid to prevent kidney injury. Fibromyalgia is a chronic condition that causes pain all over the body. Um, they're going to have like multiple tender points, symptoms, they're going to have fatigue, sleep disturbances, emotional distress. Um, you want to treat the cause, sorry, treat the symptom, muscle relaxants, narcotics, NSAIDs, depending on where they are. Okay, the nurse is planning the care for a patient diagnosed with Parkinson's disease, what would be a therapeutic goal of treatment for the disease process? So will they experience periods of acnesia throughout the day or take prescribed medications correctly, be able to enjoy a family outing with the spouse, be able to carry out activities of daily living? So for the goal of Parkinson's disease is to be able to maintain their function, the ADLs. Um, so here's more under the musculoskeletal. Someone has sprain. It's basically a torn ligament. For that, you want to do rice, which is rest, ice, um, compression, and elevation. Next one is carpal tunnel. It's when the median, median nerve is compressed at the wrist. It's usually from typing a lot and stuff like that. Treatment for that is going to be a splint. Joint dislocation, you should just know it could be an emergency because it could compress the surrounding vascular and cause limb threatening ischemia. Okay, septic arthritis. So sepsis, it's basically sepsis in the joint. Um, the joint could be like the hip or something like that, and it causes inflammation. It's an emergency because the joint be could become necrotic. Symptoms are going to be localized symptoms like pain, limited range of motion. You could also have systemic symptoms like fever, etc. Um, causes are usually recent surgery, injections, trauma, um, and stuff like that. Treatment because it's sepsis is going to be antibiotics. 
Um, the next thing we're going to talk about is fat embolism. So emboli is basically it's like a clot that went, like moved on. So um, it's an embolus, not moved on, traveled more like. So an embolus that is made up of fat, it travels and that could lodge somewhere. The the main thing about fat emboli is that it's 24 to 72 hours post ortho surgery. So you're especially like a um, the long bone. So you're going to see that in the question. So it's going to be like the the patient had surgery a while ago, 24 hours ago, um, and now is having symptoms of respiratory distress, neuro, potassium, rash. What do they have? Okay, the goal over here is to have surgery right away and to minimize movement of the injured extremity. We touched about this a little bit before, but now we're going to go into a little bit more detail. Compartment syndrome is swelling and increased increased pressure within a confined space, and that could lead to tissue ischemia. So the, the three, um, it's, it's, it's called the six P's that are going to be like the sign and symptoms that are going to cue you into the person having compartment syndrome. So pain that's not relieved by um, medication, pallor, pulselessness, paresthesia, so, and, so tingling and numbness, oculothermic, which is coolness, pressure, and paralysis. So if you have any of those, you want to think automatically of compartment syndrome. The main, and the main one they're going to ask is like the pain is not really with medication. The treatment for that is going to be um, a fasciotomy. You see over here, they make a line and they release the pressure. Um, okay, the mandibular fracture is basically a fracture of the jaw. This is the priority is if the teeth is wired. Um, in general, the priority, especially of somewhere over here, over here, is a patent airway. That's pretty much the priority over here. Um, rotator cuff tear, what you want to watch out for over there is that, well, it usually happens from like when someone keeps using it, like let's just say they're swimming or tennis, something that they're using the rotator cuff. Um, symptoms are going to be shoulder pain, weakness, and you want to just do imaging to find that out. Okay, so buck traction is, as you see over here, it's weights over here that pull and immobilize the lower limb to reduce pain or spasm until the patient could have surgery. Um, you want to watch out for nerve, you want to check neurovascular status pretty often and you want to watch the pain level because if it's increasing it could indicate that there's neurovascular compromise. Um, you want the weights to be free hanging and not placed on the bed or touching the floor. Colleen's fracture is basically a type of fracture of the wrist so um, it's usually from breaking the fall, like when they come down, they put their hand down and that's Colleen's fracture. Okay, so with the hip replacement, you wanna avoid adduction. So ab is the way, ad is like closer. Um, you also wanna place like a pillow between the knees if they're side lying. The total knee replacement, you wanna, you wanna give them pain medication. Your goal is to restore the function, early ambulation, PT, um, etc. So, so question over here is a patient with a recent fracture is suspected of having compartment syndrome. Assessment finding would include which symptoms? So number one, body-wide decrease in bone mass, a growth in and around the bone, inability to perform active movement, pain with passive movement, inability to perform passive movement, pain with active movement. That's going to be C, they can perform active movement and pain with passive movement. Okay, so hypovolemia is a decrease of volume of blood plasma. You can have symptoms of hypotension, tachycardia, decrease urine output, narrowing pulse. 
Panarin and pulse pressure. The treatment number one is going to be fluids, and if that doesn't work, it's going to be your vasopressors like norepinephrine, etc. Um, sepsis is, is an exaggerated response to an infection in the bloodstream. It's very life threatening and it needs to be treated. Symptoms are going to be uh, symptoms of infection, fever, etc. But, but the elderly could have atypical symptoms, they could go altered mental, hypothermic, etc. Treatment is going to be simple antibiotics. Okay, in this slide, we're going to compare and contrast peripheral artery disease, which is known as arterial insufficiency, and peripheral venous disease, which is known as venous insufficiency. So peripheral artery disease is narrowing of the artery. So um, when it's like a hose, when you kink it, it's going to be decreased flow. So basically narrowing of the artery, causing decreased blood flow to an area. Peripheral venous disease is going to be the venous blood from the legs cannot get back to the heart, so it just pulls in the legs, pulls in the veins more like. Anyways, risk factors for peripheral artery disease are smoking, hyperlipidemia, hypertension. Risk factors for peripheral venous disease are immobility, pregnancy, and varicose veins. Um, symptoms, so here are some symptoms. The pain, peripheral artery disease, is going to be worse when you elevate it. And better when you are in straight because then you're going to have more blood flow going in. The pain peripheral venous is going to be worse when you're walking and better when you elevate it because then it decrease because then the blood that's pooling there could go back to the heart. Ulcers um, in peripheral artery disease are going to be in the most distal body parts, gray and pale base, and ulcers for peripheral venous disease are going to be the medial aspect of the angle and pink base, as you see in these pictures over here. Edema with peripheral artery disease, no. Peripheral venous disease, yes, because it's pooling. Skin peripheral artery disease is going to be of no blood flow, so cool, dry, hairless, because um, the blood pr could promote the hair growing, shiny. Peripheral venous disease is going to be warm because there's a lot of blood flow there, brown discoloration, and thick. Uh, oh, okay, now we go on to DVT, deep vein thrombosis. It's basically a blood clot in the deep veins. For this, there's um, risk factors. So risk factors would include stuff like immobility, um, surgery, varicose veins, because the blood is pooling there, not moving so much, and older age. Prevention, you could wear the you know, the compression stockings, frequent neurovascular assessments, ambulation, so you move. Symptoms are going to be unilateral leg pain. For this, you treatment is going to be anticoagulants, usually like a heparin drip. You want them not to massage the area to use um, and not to use compression stockings once they have a clot. That's before they have a clot. You're supposed to use it. You, because you don't want the, the clot to break off and become a pulmonary embolism. No restrictive clothing, etc. Pulmonary embolism is a, a blood clot, so a DVT, but it traveled. It broke off and traveled. And the problem is it travels to the lungs, and then you could have respiratory distress. So... Symptoms are going to be anxiety, restlessness, chest pain, shortness of breath, tachypnea, cough, all like lung symptoms. The treatment for this is going to be, first of all, you want to treat, you know, your respiratory distress after, and then give oxygen after that anticoagulants. Uh, polycythemia vera is a type of blood cancer in which the body makes too many red blood cells. So this causes the blood to become very thick, and thick blood could lead to clot. So therefore, you want to monitor them for signs of clots, thrombosis, and strokes. DIC, disseminated intravascular coagulation, is when the platelets and clotting factors are consumed in, like in the clotting, and then when the blood 
needs it again, they can't use it. So basically, it uses up all, all its clotting factors, and then the next time, you know, something happens, it just bleeds out because there's no clotting process. Sometimes you're going to have frank external bleeding. So let's just say you do a simple blood draw. You know, it should be caught, but it's not. It just keeps, keeps, keeps bleeding. Um, internal bleeding signs like batesia, ecchymosis, hematuria, etc. And even respiratory distress because the bleeding and clotting in the lungs. Treatment is going to be rapid replacement of the clotting factors like fresh fo frozen plasma, platelets, blood, etc. Von Willebrand disease is when they're missing the clotting factors. You don't really have to know the number or anything like that. It is genetic, and to stop the bleeding, you want to give intranasal the desmopressin thrombin. If it's major bleeding, you want to replace the clotting factor. ITP is immune thrombocytopenia perperla, and that is an autoimmune dis disease where the antibodies destroy all the platelets. Symptoms, you're also going to have symptoms of bleeding like potassia, and the platelet count is going to be very low. So that's also going to be your clue. When the platelet count is very low, they're at risk for bleeding, so interventions are going to be bleeding precaution. For instance, a soft, a soft, um, a soft toothbrush, because when you brush your teeth, you don't want them to bleed. You want to, if you're going to floss, very gentle, non-alcoholic mouthwash. No, um, you want them to take like stool softeners so they're not straining. No NSAIDs because they could cause bleeding, especially GI, etc. Um, okay, so here's information about blood transfusions. Before starting a blood transfusion, you always want to tell the patient to um, to to go to the bathroom. You you have to have consent. You have to make sure that they you have a type and cross, you know, like that the blood is compatible. And when you get the blood, you have to get the blood from the blood from the blood bank. You have to verify it with another nurse. You need two patient identifiers there you want to use your y tubing so that's this tubing over here um it's like it's like this one is to blood one is to saline first you're going to run the saline then you're going to stop it and then you're going to run the blood um once you have the the transfusion going you have to remain with them for 15 minutes and take your vials before after 15 minutes and then along the, the transfusion as needed um, the blood is usually given through an 18 gauge catheter or larger. Um, you want to transfuse the blood within four hours, but you know, it's going to say in the order, let's say they want it over two hours, etc. but the, the longest they're going to want it over is four hours. You want to look out for complications. So complications are acute hemolytic transfusion reaction, which is life threatening. And it's basically when the patient's antibodies are going to destroy the red blood cells. Usually this causes incompatibility, that the blood is not compatible with the blood. That their, yeah, blood is not compatible. Early signs of reaction is going to be fever, anxiety, tachycardia, hypotension. And that's basically why you're in the, in the room with them for 15 minutes to monitor for that. Because usually if they'll have a reaction, it will be within the first 15 minutes. So question, the nurse has, has obtained a unit of blood from the blood bank and has checked the blood properly with another nurse. Just before beginning the transfusion, the nurse assesses for which of the following items. Vital signs, skin color, urine output, or latest hematocrit level. So change in vital signs during the transfusion could indicate a reaction occurred. So, so that's why you have to assess the vital signs before and after to compare and contrast. Um, what an Allen's test is, it's before collecting blood for ABGs. You are going to do exactly what they're doing over there in the picture over here. You're basically 
I'm going to black the blood supply and see if a normal color returns to the hand. If it does, it means that one artery is healthy enough to supply blood to your hand all by itself, and the ABGs could be drawn. If it's negative, then you want to use a different site. Uh, phlebotomy is a process of drawing blood. You want to you wanna clean the site, you want to fix and hold the vein, insert the needle, 15 degrees. Don't attempt to insert it more than two times per person if you can't get it, ask someone else. Um, never do blood on the same side as an AV fistula or a mastectomy. You should have a limb molar for that side. And that's pretty much it. Phlebitis is inflammation of a vein. So that's like a complication of giving IV therapy. So you're going to see it's going to be irritated. Um, a lot of times it's the certain medications that could irritate it, like vancomycin, for instance, or even a poor insertion technique. Symptoms are going to be pain, swelling, and warmth at the site. Redness is going to be along the vein, you're going to see. And if this occurs, you want to remove the IV site because it could lead to thrombophlebitis and emboli. Infiltration is basically when the solution infuses into the surrounding tissue of wherever it is. You want to discontinue the IV site right away and start a new one on a different extremity. You want to elevate and do a compress on it. The next complication of IV is extravasation. It's the same exact thing except for the only difference is that it's with certain medications, which are called Vessin solution. So these are stuff that are known to irritate the vein, like chemotherapy, for instance, norepinephrine, etc. If this happens, you want to stop the medication right away, aspirate, and give an antidote, like phenyltolamine. You usually want to give like stuff like that, like norepinephrine through a central line, not a peripheral line, because that could happen. Okay, we're going to sugar and diabetes. So, metabolic syndrome is basically a cluster of conditions that happen together that can increase one's chance of heart disease and diabetes. A mnemonic for that is we better think high glucose. The W stands for waist circumference. B stands for blood pressure. T stands for triglycerides. H stands for HDL. G stands for glucose. Hypoglycemia is when they're the blood sugar is too low. It's actually more dangerous than hyperglycemia. And the reason for this is because no sugar in the brain could lead to neuro impairment. Symptoms are going to be symptoms like tachycardia, altered mental status, irritability, tremors, sweating, like that. Treatment for that. So if they are conscious, you want to give them 15 grams of carbs which is usually orange juice, it has high sugar, milk, high sugar, something like that. You want to recheck the blood sugar like 15 minutes later. If they cannot have something orally for just because they don't eat something orally for their condition or because they're unconscious, then you want to give them glucagon, 50 IV push. The most common cause of hypoglycemia is taking too much insulin. So here's a comparison of DKA, which is diabetes ketoacidosis, and HHS. These are both complications of hyperglycemia, too much sugar. So what DKA is severe hyperglycemia from no insulin in the body or infection or stress in the body. HHS or HHNS which is hypoglycemia, hyperosmolic state, is when it's severe hypoglycemia, but there is insulin in the body. So there's no ketones present. The main difference between these two is that DKA, as the name says, ketoacidosis, is going to have ketones and systemic acidosis, and HHS is going to be no significant ketones and no acidosis. 
blood sugar levels are going to be different also in DKA they're usually going to be more than 300 as opposed to HHS is going to be more than 600. Other symptoms that are present with DKA is cosmal respirations which is like a fruity smell of the breath, abdominal pain, and HHS could be profound diarrhea, dehydration I mean, and shallow respirations. DKA is more common in type 1 diabetes and HHS is type 2 diabetes. Treatment for both is going to be fluid replacement and correcting electrolyte imbalance and insulin. So something called stress-induced hypoglycemia, and that is usually caused by trauma, acute illness, infection, because stress in the body causes the glucose to go up. And just like a random fact, about 80% of ICU patients who are this stress on the body for them become hypoglycemia and they do not have diabetes. Complications of hypoglycemia are infection, acute kidney injury, etc. To prevent this, you want a specific glucose level to be watched. Diabetic sick day management is basically educating them that on sick days, you want them to take the blood glucose level every one to four hours, and you want increase or decrease, and you want to check out increase or decrease levels. You want them to get enough hydration and test the urine ketones frequently. Peripheral neuropathy is nerve damage caused by chronically high blood sugar and diabetes. It could lead to numbness, loss of sensation, pain in the feet, the most com and it's actually the most common complication of diabetes. For them, it's basically patient education. You want to wash their feet daily with warm water, mild soaps. You want to test the water with the thermometer before putting the because they have because with the diabetes, like I just said, they don't really have much sensation to their feet so they could stick their feet in really hot water and not even know it and then you know get burned and not even know it also you want to watch for like their toenails you want them to cut it straight so that they don't get infected and not know about it they should not go barefoot you want them to wear good shoes daily exercise etc Okay, next we go on to alcohol. Alcohol is actually a CNS depressant. So it can cause hypoglycemia and it, it also causes vitamin B12 and thiamine deficiency. So alcohol use disorder, which is like when you're saying that someone has alcoholism, is when they get dependent on alcohol and it becomes the sole focus of their life. It impacts their EDLs. Alcohol intoxication symptoms, you're going to see confusion, coordination about, like they're going to like a walk, wearily, drowsiness, slurred speech, mood swings, and just not acting themselves, like rowdy, etc. Alcohol withdrawal usually starts eight hours after the last drink and peaks around 24 to 48 hours. When they're withdrawing, they might have, they might be agitated, hyperflexia, delirium tremors, and treatment for that is going to be your Ativan, sorry, your benzodiazepines, like lorazepam, diazepam, etc. Okay, so Wernicke's encephalopathy is a neurological disorder induced by thiamine or vitamin B1 deficiency, which, like we said before, is seen in alcoholics. Symptoms are going to be altered mental status, oculomotor, motor dysfunction, ataxia. It's reversible by replacing the thiamine. The problem is that if not treated, it could cause Korsakoff syndrome, which is irreversible. Next, we go on to opioid withdrawal. Symptoms for that is going to be the same symptoms as CNS symptoms. So like increased blood pressure, tachycardia, sweating, insomnia, diarrhea. The treatment for that is going to be giving them opioids like methadone, buprenorphine, or a non-opioid like clonidine. So question, a nurse is caring for a patient whose blood glucose level is 55. What is the nurse, what is the likely nursing response? 
give them glucagon injection, a small meal, 10 to 15 grams of carbohydrates, and a small snack of high protein food. The answer to this is going to be to give 10 to 15 grams of carbohydrates. If they're not conscious, then you give the glucagon. Okay, so that's the end of med search section part two. We're going to have one more part and then we've done the whole med search. So stay tuned for that. If you want any of this or any of my my videos on the NCLEX series in no form, go to my website at www.sarrn.com. The link is in the description box below. If you have any questions, just email me or write in the comment section and stay tuned for the next one.